In this video, I will present the Bohr model of the atom. This delivered a really remarkable result for predicting very accurately the spectral lines of hydrogen. And it really was one of the most remarkable outcomes of early quantum physics. So where we were then was with the Rutherford model of the atom, where we have a nucleus containing all the positive charge of the atom, and we have electrons orbiting that uh, dense nucleus. Now with classical physics, the expectation would be that um, a charged particle orbiting around the nucleus like that would be constantly emitting electromagnetic radiation. And furthermore, we would expect the electrons to slowly but surely, in fact rather rapidly if you do the calculations by classical physics, would rapidly fall in towards the center and collapse into the nucleus. And as they do so, they'd be emitting um, uh, electromagnetic radiation all the time. So initially starting off with high energy emissions, and then as they fall inward, they'd be uh, releasing lower energy electromagnetic radiation. Now, uh, experimentally, that is not at all what we see. I'm glad to say, you know, atoms are for the most part stable but this clearly indicates a problem with the Rutherford model of the atom. So what is it that we do see experimentally? Well, we know that hydrogen, for example, emits very distinct wavelengths of light. If you put it in a gas discharge tube, you'll see particular wavelengths of light being emitted. And that was um, expressed by the Rydberg formula that was just a purely empirical fit to the data, no insight into the physics whatsoever. What it did was be able to tell us the wavelengths of light coming off from hydrogen gas, and it told us that those wavelengths only were at discrete positions in the spectrum. We don't get a continuous range of wavelengths being emitted from hydrogen, but rather a discrete set of lines. Now, to try and see where we can go next, we know uh, from Planck's law and from what Albert Einstein had done that the energy of a photon is given by HF. And so if we do some very basic uh, rearrangement of that, we know that the frequency is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength. And then we can easily rearrange that and say that therefore that expression on the left-hand side of this Rydberg formula, in other words, the one over lambda is just given by energy divided by HC, where H is Planck's constant, C is the speed of light. Therefore, that shows us, quite intuitively actually, that therefore, just as the wavelengths correspond to um, being discrete for hydrogen, therefore also the energies are discrete because this term on the right-hand side, this difference between these two fractions, can only deliver a discrete set of values. And so likewise, the same is true for the energy, just as it was true for the frequencies and the wavelengths, of course. So that implies the hydrogen atom must have a discrete set of uh, energy states or energy levels because m and n in this expression are integers. Perhaps it was this that inspired Niels Bohr. So what was it that Niels Bohr put forward? You can see here he got the Nobel Prize in 1922. So to overcome the problems with the Rutherford model of the atom, he suggested that the electron orbits must be quantized. So he postulated that electrons could only orbit um, at very specific um, radii and velocities corresponding to very specific energy states. And that nonetheless, he was using classical equations of motion um, in his model, as we will see, the only requirement being this discretization of the energy. And that basically meant particular orbit radii and particular velocities of the electrons. So we'll see that presently. So the idea being that with these discrete energy states dictated by these integer quantum numbers, that an electron can only jump between these discrete energy states. It's like, it's like a quantum leap or a quantum jump between these specific energy states. And that they cannot kind of continuously vary between those orbits. And as we'll see presently, they can change orbits, uh, jump between them, either by emitting or absorbing photons, which of course would 
would correspond very nicely with the hydrogen emission spectra that we see, as well as the hydrogen absorption spectrum, for example, when we see those dips in the spectrum of sunlight. Okay, so with the Bohr model then, we're saying that uh, we have an electron orbiting a proton using classical uh, equations of motion, but that crucially, the orbit radius is going to be discretized, so only certain radii will be permitted. So I'm kind of showing that here with these uh, discrete sets of radii. In reality, these would be very differently spaced, but just to give you the idea. And that furthermore, the velocity is also in discrete uh, quantities as well. And that's what that in combination with the discrete radii is what gives us those discrete energy states of the electron. Okay, so therefore, if we've got an electron at a, at a higher orbit level, um, and that corresponds to a higher energy level, it can fall down to a lower energy level, so from n equals 3 to n equals 2, by emitting energy in the form of a photon of energy hf, again using Planck's constant and the frequency, um, you know, as we know from Albert Einstein's work on the photoelectric effect. So therefore, the energy of the photon is just given by the difference in energy between those two states. Now that's for the emission of light, for example, from a hydrogen atom, but it also works beautifully for absorption because if we've got an incoming photon that precisely matches the difference in energy between two states, then that photon can be absorbed and the electron can move up to a higher energy level, a higher orbit radius. So that's the basic model expressed uh, by this very simple equation. In other words, any change between two energy states can be accounted for by a photon of that energy, either emitting the photon or absorbing the photon according to the direction of energy change. So really, Bohr's uh, postulate really came down uh, to this. He postulated that angular momentum is quantized, and so we'll now unpack what that means. Well, first of all, what is momentum? Well, we know that momentum is just defined by the mass of an object multiplied by its velocity. So if you increase an object's velocity, if you increase its mass, then you'll be increasing its momentum. So in a similar fashion, angular momentum is defined by mv, but now also multiplied by the radius. So with angular momentum, we're thinking about an object moving in a circle, in an orbit if you like, and it has a mass, of course, it has a velocity, but now it has a radius of its circular motion. Okay, so that greater, a greater radius, if we hold mass and velocity constant, if we just increase the radius, then we get a higher angular momentum. Now classically, there's no limits on those choices of the velocity and the radius. They can take on any continuous value. But of course, with Bohr's model, we will be quantizing angular momentum. Okay, and so this is Bohr's uh, postulate about angular momentum being quantized. We take that angular momentum expression, mass times velocity times radius, and we say that that can only take on integer multiples of Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. So this can seem a bit ad hoc, but it's worth staying with it because we'll find quite a remarkable outcome and we'll deal with some of the ad hoc assumptions later on in, in another video. Okay, so if the mass m is fixed, the mass of the electron, then we know that to quantize this, then the only things that we can be changing, of course, are the velocity of the electron and the radius of orbit of the electron. So we're going to say, let's have a subscript n, integer n, um, for the, the velocities. In other words, it can take on particular vo velocities, but they'll be corresponding to particular um, values of n, where n is 1, 2, 3, an integer value, and so on. And likewise for the radius, so that it can only take on particular values. Okay, so we're going to say that m, which is what it is, the mass of the electron times vn times rn, is equal to integer multiples of h over 2 pi. Okay, so now we've got, again, the nucleus here, the electron orbiting. Uh, we know that there's going to be an electrostatic attraction between the electron 
and the positively charged nucleus. And just by using classical um, electromagnetism expressions, just from electrostatic theory, we know that the force between them is just going to be the charge of the electron multiplied by the charge of the nucleus. And if it's a proton for a hydrogen atom, that's going to be E squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught permittivity of free space multiplied by the distance between them squared. Okay, so that's just very, very classical expression. That's the force of attraction. And we're going to say that's equal to the centripetal force. In other words, force is mass times acceleration. This is circular motion, and so acceleration is just v squared over r. And so we're going to say that that force of attraction explains the circular motion of the electron around the nucleus. Again, the, cr the key thing here is we've now got this subscript n for the r and the subscript n for the v, again meaning the radius can only take on particular values and the velocity can only take on particular values values, discrete values. Okay, so what we can do with these two, is two expressions, we've got two equations with two unknowns, if you like, the velocity and uh, the radius. So we can solve these two expressions simultaneously to find Rn and Vn. So if we do that, we get these solutions arising from that force um, balance equation that I just showed we get these outcomes, the solutions for Rn and Vn, and you'll notice that, of course, n features in both expressions. So already we can begin to see what this is getting for us. So orbit radius, if we plug in n equals 1 for the lowest energy state, if you like, the smallest orbit radius, then uh, we get this expression on the bottom right here. And that's just this Rn with setting n equal to 1. So that's setting n equal to 1 there. And we just end up with this expression, which delivers the value known as the Bohr radius, which is the most probable distance between the nucleus and the electron in a hydrogen atom. And we know that that's about half an angstrom. An, an atom is typically an angstrom, 10 to the minus 10, the Bohr radius, is, you know, as, as would be understandable, half of that atomic size, approximate size. So it's about 0.5 times 10 to the minus 10. Now, in fact, this is where I, I like to just think again about what we're talking about in terms of the orbit of the electron um, in comparison, the orbit size, the distance, compared to the size of the nucleus. If you imagine a laptop uh, being a representative of the nucleus of a hydrogen atom, then the electron is orbiting my laptop at a distance of eight kilometers away. So that's an awful lot of empty space. But that's just a quick aside, and also just a reminder that if we did the mass comparison, if my laptop was two kilograms, then the electron would weigh about as much as a sugar cube, and again, located eight kilometers away from my computer. So a lot of free space in a, in a hydrogen atom. Anyway, back to the Bohr model. So what we're going to do now is with these discrete uh, values for the radius, discrete values for the velocity of the electron as it orbits around the nucleus here, we're going to try and calculate, or we will calculate, the total energy for that state n. So remember we've got this discrete value n. Um, and we're going to say the total energy is simply, as we often do in physics, just the summation of the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. So using this classical expression here for the kinetic energy, that's just half mv squared. We just plug in the value for the velocity and we get this outcome on the right-hand side. If we now find the potential energy, and again, this is just conventional electrostatic theory of the potential energy between two charged particles. And here we've got the electron, of course, and the proton in the uh, hydrogen nucleus. And so that's just going to be e squared in the numerator here, divided by 4 pi epsilon naught um, and the distance between them, which is, of course, one of these discrete radial values, Rn. So if we plug in our discrete radial value, Rn, into that conventional expression for the potential energy between two charged particles, then we get that expression on the right-hand side. Now, the total energy, we just sum those two together. So you can see I've grouped the terms here to try and help. 
Um, basically, we're taking one eighth of this overall uh, collection of constants here, and then we're subtracting off one quarter of that same collection of constants. So it's quite easy to see, it's one eighth minus a quarter leaves us with minus one eighth of that collection of constants. And that's the energy uh, for state n in the Bohr model of the atom. Okay, and it's worth noting here that the total energy is uh, described as negative. And what that means is that we would need to put energy in to liberate an electron from one of its um, orbits around uh, the nucleus of the hydrogen atom. Okay, so let's see where this is going to take us. Recall again the Rydberg formula describing the hydrogen uh, line spectra that we know about. Okay, this was an empirically, experimentally found formula by Rydberg. Okay, just expressing the, the line spectra in hydrogen. And you'll remember from earlier as well, uh, we saw that we could rewrite that formula as E is equal to HCR, again, times this difference between two fractions involving integer values. Now, what we've just shown with that Bohr model by saying the total energy of state n, just given by kinetic energy plus potential energy, with those discrete values for the radius and discrete values for the velocity, we end up with this expression for the total energy of state n of the electron orbiting the nucleus. And so you can see we get that expression there. And notice we've got that integer value in the denominator here which means we can express the difference between two energy states as given by the Bohr model of the atom. So if we look at the difference between two states, in other words, all I'm going to do is just um, pull out the 1 over n squared here and then consider another integer value. I'm going to use an integer m. Apologies for the clash with the mass of the electron. I'm sure you can figure that one out just like I've used an integer m in the Rydberg formula. So I'm going to do the same here, use an integer m and an integer n to denote two different quantum numbers, two different energy states in the Bohr model. Um, so if I, if I pull out um, those, then I can find an expression for the difference between two energy levels using just the Bohr model of the atom. Now, of course, you can see that I can make a comparison with the Rydberg formula because this is the energy here and here is the energy corresponding to the difference between two states. And so therefore I'll be able to equate that coefficient here for the difference between those two fractions with this coefficient here for the difference between those two fractions. So we'll do that in the next slide. There I'm just emphasizing that I've just pulled out that n squared and, and shown a different value of, of n, so I'm using m as a different integer to denote the difference in energy states. Okay, so this is what we had before for the Rydberg formula, and this is what we had with the Bohr model, and I'm explicitly showing it's an overall energy, um, which, is, which is explained by the difference between two energy states. So now, if I equate those two, as I've already implied, then I can solve for that mysterious Rydberg constant. And we find this expression for that Rydberg constant. Now remember, that Rydberg constant was just empirical. It was just a formula that was devised that fitted the emission line spectra. But with the Bohr model of the atom, we now explain that Rydberg constant in terms of fundamental constants. The mass of the electron, the fourth power of the fundamental unit of charge, Planck's constant cubed, speed of light, permittivity of free space squared, a remarkable collection of fundamental constants, which when combined are giving us the Rydberg constant. So this is really remarkable and shows in fact the Rydberg constant is not at all some kind of fundamental constant because it can be composed of other constants which are fundamental. And um, this amazingly matches the experimentally found value for the Rydberg constant to within 0.1%. Quite remarkable given the relative simplicity 
of the Bohr model of the atom, just using that energy is equal to potential energy plus kinetic energy with discretization of the angular momentum. So what a successful result it is for the Bohr model. We get this expression for the energy, kinetic energy plus potential energy, given by this. And by using that Rydberg formula, um, we can see actually that this gives us the Rydberg constant, which perfectly explains all of these line spectra for the hydrogen atom. So a really quite a remarkable outcome. Um, just noting again that the energy here is uh, negative for each state. That means we need to put energy in in order to liberate an electron from a particular state. So n equals 1 is the ground state, and that would mean we need to put a lot of energy in to liberate that electron. And in fact, the energy we need to, to liberate an electron from energy state n equals 1 is known as the ionization energy. So there we just look at the difference between um, the infinite energy state, that's effectively free from the, uh, the proton, from the nucleus. We look at the difference between that energy state, n is equal to infinity. So if you put that in here, then we get a zero because n infinity squared in the denominator gives a zero. And then when we put a one for the ground state, then we get this expression. And that turns out to give us 13.6 electron volts as being the amount of energy needed to liberate um, an electron from the orbit if that electron is in energy state in the ground state n equals 1. And that agrees to within 0.1% of experimental measurements of what the ionization energy actually is for hydrogen. So again, very simple Bohr model, just with quantization of angular momentum, we get remarkable agreement with experiment. Okay, so it's an amazing outcome. We can calculate using fundamental physical constants, all of which are found independently of the Bohr model, you know, using the speed of light, Planck's constant, mass of the electron, and so on. Using those physical constants, we can find the Rydberg constant, which in turn explains the spectral lines that we see for hydrogen, you know, whether it's the emission spectra, as shown here again, uh, with this gas uh, discharge tube here, or indeed explains some of the reduced um, lines, those kind of um, lost values in the spectrum of the sun, where we've got those reduced components if we look at the sun's spectrum. So those reduced components in the spectrum of the sun are beautifully explained by the Bohr model of the atom when applied to hydrogen. So hope you've enjoyed that and thanks for listening.